So from the time I was like 15, uh, my life's dream was to be a male stripper. That's Your what I want. dream, like you, my dream was to become a stripper. God. Go. The One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the ninety-nine percent and become a one percenter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. This is your host, Sam Bakhtiar, and I have a really interesting show for you. Really interesting. When Rob first, you know, reached out to me and told me about his book and his premise. I was so intrigued and I was like, man, I gotta kind of get this guy on the show and have him talk about it because this is something that nobody wants to talk about, right? And uh, it's really a concept of delayed gratification, which in my opinion is one of the biggest, uh, biggest precursors to success in anything in life. So a little bit about Rob. Rob is a self-professed reformed bad boy with a riveting personal testimony from living as the biggest male stripper, hello, in his home state of Maryland, to running a nightlife in Baltimore, the city he grew up in. He gave up that fast life and casual sex and partying and all that kind of stuff. And now he's a founder of thriving nonprofit City Fam with a mission to solve loneliness. He's the author of the best-selling book, Why Waiting Works and the Truth About Sex. So we're going to talk about waiting, you know, and not having sex. And that, you know, that's got to be one of the hardest things in life. He has the number one video in his category worldwide on YouTube with 10 reasons not to have sex before marriage with over 1.6 million views and climbing. Rob's story has recently been featured in numerous publications, including God TV, Daily Mail, Antenna Stars, Trinidad's, and others. Welcome, Rob. Thanks for having me on, Sam. So you went from literally, I always say, well, how, how can I say it? Literally just smashing girls. That, <laughs> that was a man whore. Is, is, that what, is, is that what we say these days? You know, I don't know what the proper term these, these days, you know what I mean? You know, uh, back in my days, in, in, in the 90s, we said knocking boots. Now, <laughs> I remember you know, that. You remember that? Yeah, so, so now we say smashing. So you were basically smashing girls, you know, strippers, smashing girls, nightlife. So all of a sudden, like, you know what? You shouldn't have sex till you get married, something like that. So tell me about your story, bro. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was born to a young mom. My mom got pregnant with me at 14. And, you know, dad was never in the same state. So I just kind of ran the streets as a kid. My mom worked, you know, she, she had an eighth grade education. So she was just trying to put food on the table. And there was never really a strong male role model in the picture. So I didn't really get to see that model for me. So I just watched television and movies and kind of learned to be a man from that. And everything that I saw about being a man was you would go with girls. So from the time I was like 15, uh, my life's dream was to be a male stripper. That's Your what I was. Your dream, like you, my dream was to become a stripper. Gosh, man, that's like every, every mom and dad's nightmare. <laughs> and more, more, more every dad's nightmare than it is uh, the moms. I mean, especially if you have a girl, if you have a daughter, your number one job is to keep her off the pole. I mean, even your mom, that's probably like, man, come on, man. Now, you know what? My mom, my mom was only 15 years older than me. So she actually would. So this is how it started. She did. Yeah. So so this is how it started. I came, I came in, I was probably about 15 years old. I was playing outside or whatever. I might've even been like 14. But there was a videotape laying on the coffee table that my mom had rented with her friends. I didn't know what it was. I walked over, I grabbed it, I picked it up, I put it in the VCR. Some of y'all know what a VCR is still, I think. Oh, yeah, we know, I know what that is. <laughs> anyway, all of a sudden on the television were male strippers. And I remember l- looking at the television thinking, that's what I want to be when I grow up. So my mom had rented this tape with her friends of these strippers, and I didn't even know what your strippers mom were. Told your pat. You yeah. first got a stripper, your mom was like, you know, watching, and then. So I'm sorry, man. All of a sudden, I, I, I just, you know, just because your mom was only like 15 years older than you, she was probably like, oh, let's go see my son. Bring your dollar bills, girls. Let's go. Yeah, she would. She brought a lot of friends. Or she was a waitress. So she'd bring a lot of her waitress friends. And I almost hooked up with one of her friends. But yeah, I mean, it was more. See, the thing is, the difference when you're a male stripper and you're a female stripper, when you're a male stripper, it's not a sexual. It's more fun, funny, laughing. Like I used to do a lot of birthday and bachelorette parties 
And I would go over, I would dance for the bachelorette, and then I would go over and I would either grab the biggest girl, the heaviest girl in the room, or I'd grab grandma. And you bend her over and you smack grandma on the ass a few times, and you're the you you that you're successful. Everyone laughs. You, you know that's what they want. They want to laugh. So, but when you're a female stripper, oh no, that's completely different. Guys are trying to see how far they can go sexually. So it's a, it's a little bit different. So anyway, I became a stripper when I was 19. That was my dream. Um, you know, I, I over the years I kind of worked my way up the ranks. I started. I was working for every different agency in Baltimore. I was like the number one guy on the roster. I was in the phone book. I was you know, making what I thought was a lot of money. I was very popular. Um, I had a lot of, a lot of women, women came very easily to me. And, but I would always see the, I would always see the consequences in my relationship. So like I, what would happen is we'd have sex quickly, me and the girl. And usually I would lose interest immediately after ejaculating, but sometimes I'd continue sleeping with the girl and then we would drift into a relationship. But I would notice that it was never I, that. I hate, don't you hate when that happens? <laughs> yeah, well, that happened. That that happened a few times. But it was the relationship. I would notice that it wasn't that great, and I would always feel like something was missing. And then I, what would happen is I'd be looking over my shoulder at other women, wondering if I could be happier with them. That, you know, at some point maybe I'll be looking at porn because I would be, feel like, well, maybe that'll fill this void. And then eventually I would be cheating, and that happened to me. My first girlfriend, same pattern, five years. You know, we, we dated for five years. I, I was completely like stuck in something. I wasn't in love, but I couldn't get out of it either. It was weird. And when I finally brought myself to tell my girlfriend I wasn't sure if I was in love with her, we broke up. She started dating somebody else, and it threw me for a loop. Like I fell into a deep depression, unexpected to me. And then I, I reeled her back in. She came back to me. We dated, you know, and then I real, and then I was like, "What the hell did I do that for?" I was free. Dated another year. She I told her again, "I'm not sure if I'm in love with you." She broke up. We broke up. She dated somebody else. Guess what happened again? I felt really depressed. I real, I tried to reel her back in again, and and th at that point, I realized I was caught in something that I didn't have any control of, but I couldn't do anything about it. But fortunately for me, she ended up marrying that guy. She didn't come back, and I and so this I was in my mid twenties when all this happened. And th that's when I transitioned into a life of, of club promoting. I was like running, running the nightlife in Baltimore. I was promoting in DC. Now I was even making even more money. I was more popular. I was, it was more women. And I remember I was like, I'm not going to get caught in that relationship trap again, you know, and <laughs> until my second relationship. And it was the exact same pattern. We had sex quickly, continued sleeping together, drifted into a relationship, you know, felt like something was missing, looking at porn, eventually cheating. And I was like, at that point, I just thought, well, something's wrong with me because I, maybe I'm just the kind of guy that, that can't fall in love or, or maybe human beings aren't supposed to be monogamous. I don't know. You know, th those were the questions I asked myself. All I knew was every relationship, it was the exact same thing. They were hot, beautiful girls. They were sweet girls. And I could not make myself only have eyes for them. And I didn't know why. And then I, when I was 27 years old, I heard God's voice for the very first time in my life. And he basically told me, look, if you start doing relationships my way, you'll be able to find tr true love. And it was, it was radical because I had never even considered that the issue was how I started my relationships. It wasn't the fact that something was wrong with me or them, or it was, I basically was not look, all I was evaluating women on when I met them was physical because I knew in the back of my mind, we were going to have sex, you know, sooner or later, probably sooner. So I didn't need to really know anything more about them besides, is she hot? And what would happen is sometimes I would get, I would drift into relationships with these girls and all there really was was physical attraction. And the crazy thing is, is like I mentioned in my 10 reasons video, the trick that the universe or God plays on you, I, it's God. I don't want to say it's a trick, but this is how it comes back on you. When you only, when you lead with physical attraction, all of a sudden, at some point, the physical attraction goes away and now you're not, you're stuck with them. You're in something, you know, what I call, it's called a soul tie in Christianese. And the, you don't even want to have sex with them, but you can't break up with them either. So like this, is, and it's, this is, the studies show that this is true. 50% of people that don't wait get divorced. Of the 50% that stay married, half of them don't have sex after year four. 
So that now they're in these relationships with the wrong person, somebody they're not in love with, and they're not even having sex. But guess what? You don't want nobody else to bang them. You know, that's the way, and that's how it comes back on you. Versus what I now know is true is you wait on the front end, you, 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 you wait. And I know it sounds extreme, Sam. It sounds crazy to say, wait till marriage. But if you wait, the reason that it works so well is because when you know you're only getting one, guess how much you have, guess how, clear, how well you evaluate. You evaluate really well versus when I was a greedy pig, I thought, well, I don't know if I want one. I might want 20, you know? So I didn't evaluate that clearly. And I, I would get that one. And I, that one wasn't what I wanted because I wasn't asking myself the hard questions. Because as bad as I want the pleasure of sex, I equally don't want the pain of divorce. So that's why you, you weigh it. Like I'll see girls now and I'm like, man, I'd really like to have sex with her. And I'm like, would you sign the marriage contract? No. Okay. Don't do it then. Because otherwise I'd sleep with them and I'd drift into a relationship or I'd sleep with them and I'd be like out. And then they're thinking I'm an asshole and I just lost that person from well, how do you ever, life. you know, you know, you remind me of one of my friends, one of my friends had the same exact blueprint as you, same thing. He was actually a stripper, you know, did it all thing. And Smart I told guy. him, and I, and, I, and I told him, Will, I go, why don't you just tell these girls that you want to have sex with them? And that's it. I do that. I did that. You know, I'm, I'm like, if you just tell them you want to have sex with them and that's it, you know, they either will take it or will leave it. Instead of like, you know, you know, you know, tell them what they want to hear. Sure. You know, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't lie. But here's the deal. Even if you're honest, all, you could be honest as the day is long and say, look, I'm only interested in sex. This is friends with benefits, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. At the point that you decide to stop having sex with that girl and you decide you want to have sex with the next girl, you're going to be an asshole. Guaranteed. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you talked about it till you're blue in the face. Because I remember I would do have these conversations. I said, I thought we talked about this. Why are you mad at me? It doesn't matter. It's the way they're wired. And, he, and I, this is what I go back to is I think everyone, it doesn't matter what your religion is. Everybody believes in the golden rule. Doing to others as you'd have them doing to you. Okay. Are you doing that? If you're fucking a girl that you don't want anything with, are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? Because that's somebody's daughter, sister, maybe their mother. And you're basically saying, I just, I just want to, you, you know, use her as a slam piece. And when I'm done with her, I want to put her back on the shelf for the next guy. Yeah. You know, that that's what you're doing. So you're not loving your neighbor. Let's not fool ourselves. And there are with everything in the same as fitness is as, as, as much as you can't eat pizza and not get fat calories or, you know, gain body fat, you cannot live that way and it not come back on you in some way. And how I believe it comes back is it prevents you from finding that person, that soulmate, you know, to help you fulfill your purpose in life. I know a lot of people don't want to get married because, you know, in this country, at least marriage, they've seen a country full of, of people do it ass backwards for a generation you know, since the 60s, the sexual revolution, you've seen people not wait. They drifted into relationships with the wrong people. They got married. The marriage was a train wreck. And now you got the kids going, man, I don't ever, I don't want to get married. I, I saw what that was like. Here's the deal. It ain't marriage ain't the problem. It's the order that you do it in. You can't, if you don't follow the instructions, of course it don't work. Marriage works great if you do it the right way. Because again, I'm asking, I don't want to go through the pain of a divorce. So now I'm going, Shh, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm exercising delayed gratification and restraint because I want to make sure that I'm pretty damn sure that this is the person that I'm going to spend a lifetime with, you know, before I, I sleep with them and, you know, potentially get stuck with them or them with me. All right. So tell me, what is the definition of sex transmutation? Because you talk, you talk a lot on that about in your book. What is that? Yeah. So that was a concept that I learned in um, the great, you know, self-development book called Think and Grow Rich. There's a whole section on it Napoleon Hill writes about, and he talks about how sex transmut sexual transmutation or sexual energy is the strongest of all human energies. And he says that it's been well known all throughout history that men of great accomplishment have taken that sexual energy and they've harnessed it and they've rechanneled it to like amass fortunes and build, you know, wealth and enterprises and inventions and all kinds of stuff. So he's like, rather than just express it physically, you can use it for other things. And, and I know in my own, my own life that that's true. But an example that I heard about it was like, you, you know, you, 
you could dam a river. You can hold the water of a river back and it's going to build up and eventually it's going to find an outlet and it's going to go somewhere. And that's exactly what my sexual energy has done for me is it wasn't until I got really obedient in that area of my life that I even knew what my purpose was. I did not know what I was on this earth to do. I thought I was going to own a bar, a corner bar. It, my God, God's purpose or the purpose that I you know, discovered for myself was so much bigger than that. I've started a nonprofit. I wrote two books. I traveled the world speaking now. It's been this amazing thing. And I believe that that is the order that we were designed to do it in because if you harness your sexual energy, you dam that river, you figure out what in the hell you're here for, you start working on that thing. And because you're now waiting, you're able to choose with a clear head, not with your balls or your dick, but with a clear brain that's not cloud it with oxytocin from the sex, you're able to, ch to choose who's the right person to come alongside of you now and help you accomplish that purpose that you found. If you look at, if you go all the way back, and I know that you, this isn't a religious podcast, but just for example purposes, I want you to look at the Garden of Eden. There were Adam and Eve. Many people think Eve was created at the same time as Adam. She wasn't. Adam was created, but before he got Eve, you know what he got? He got a job. God said, name the animals. So Adam had a purpose. Some people say that Adam was on this earth. He could have been here for thousands of years before Eve came along. We don't know. But we do know the very first words that Adam said when he first saw Eve was, finally, exclamation point. He said, finally. So you know he had waited. He delayed gratification. God gave him a purpose. And then he gave him a helpmate to fulfill that purpose. Men now don't want to do it in the right order. We hate waiting. So what we want to do is we don't even find the purpose. We don't harness our sexual energy long enough to figure it out. We choose a girl, usually the wrong one, because we're leading with physical attraction. And then there's that saying that like Tom, uh, Thomas David Thoreau, I think it is, uh, it says, men leave, lead lives of quiet desperation. And I believe what that's from is you're not living in your purpose. You're, you sit there, you, you chose the wrong person. You have no idea what in the hell you're on this earth for. You feel that gnawing sense inside you that you're supposed to do something and you don't know what it is and you're just fucked because you didn't do it in the right order. And that's, that's the consequence of putting the cart before the horse. Wow. Wow. I love that, man. I love that. So can you give us a few, few of the 10 reasons to wait? Sure. Yeah, you know, one of the, I always like to start actually with numbers because I believe that people will say, well, he's full of shit. What does he know? He's an ex-stripper or whatever. But if you look at the numbers, and I've studied them for the book, people that wait, they have a 6% divorce rate. It's pretty low. People that don't wait have a 50% divorce rate. And, and that's crazy. One of, well, your chances are one in two if you do it like everybody else of, of making it. And the worst, here's what's even worse is I don't think the other 50% are all that happy. I think oh, there's a lot of them that stay in the marriage for the kids and for the financial reasons and whatever else. And that's how it comes back on you when you don't delay gratification in this area. So there's that. The second thing I like to say to people is, look, I know that the concept sounds crazy, sounds radical, no sex before marriage. But I would say to most those people, what about no sex before love? Because most people can get down with that. They go, okay, I, I understand. I, I, I can relate to that. Okay, so here's what I would say to those people. How do you know if you're in love? Yeah. Because my, the, Bible, the Bible, and I go by that, it says the heart is deceitful. So your heart will trick you into believing something that's not true in order to give your body what it wants. So if I was dating a girl and I said, hey, Sally, I love you. Let's have sex. And she says, sure, I love you too, Rob. Let's just run down to the justice of the peace real fast. I'd be like, oh, ah, gosh. Yeah, let me think about this a little bit longer. That's the point. That's the point of marriage right there. Because now I'm going to see if my heart's lying to me. Otherwise, I could have slept with her and drifted into a relationship and been that old couple at the diner that doesn't talk to each other that we've all seen. Yeah. You know, and I don't ever want that to be me. I want to have a lot of sex. I want to have more sex than average. You know, I want to have a, I want to have a best friend that I'm physically attracted to long-term that can help me reach my purpose in life. Screw a wife. People say, you know, that's just semantics, husband, wife, marriage, whatever. It's all semantics. Who, do, who doesn't want a best friend that you're physically attracted to over the long-term, not just the short-term, because anybody can be physically attracted to somebody short-term. Trust me, I've dated girls that were slamming hot and all I wanted to do was go to sleep. 
all I wanted, to, they were, they were beautiful. I didn't want it because we didn't have a deep connection, but I never figured it out up front. I didn't evaluate. So I, I ended up in a relationship with them and we weren't even having sex. You know, everybody's heard the saying, show me the hottest girl in the world. And I'll show you guys tired of fucking her. It's there's true because that's the people that led with physical attraction and they they're dating the hottest girl in the world and they still are tired of fucking her. Yeah. So there's gotta be more than just physical. It's gotta be mental, uh, more mental connection, more, more, more just a deep connection. You know, it's so funny. You know, I used to, obviously we were, we were younger. It's all physical. You know, I was talking about that today with my workout partners and I'm like, you know what, you know, you know, I think is more of a turn on now when you actually connect, you know, emotionally to someone than physically, you know, yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, damn, I'm getting old all of a sudden. I'm like, wow, that, that's a sign of wisdom or age or whatever you want to call it. But it's so true. Everything you said here is true. And you know what? Men lie, women lie, numbers don't, you know, 50, you know, 6% sounds a lot better than 50%, you know? Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's so crazy because sometimes we just have to go back to the scripture and follow the instructions because it was all laid out there. And we all think that we know better and we try to reinvent the wheel or, re, or, or rewrite the laws and it all comes back and, you know, hunt us, you know. And like, like we said before, one of the biggest, one of the biggest factors, but biggest markers of success is delayed gratification, whether it comes with money, whether it comes with sex, whether it comes with food, whether, whatever it comes with, delayed gratification is the number one uh indicator of success you know man i you know i appreciate you so much for uh dropping knowledge rob you know this yeah. is something that you know i was like wow i gotta get to know this guy i gotta get to know his story and um for those people who are listening tell them what they can find more about you what you do you know sure. mentorship programs whatever what, you know your, your yeah. thank people. you i tell you right now man i'm gonna tell my son and my daughters that this is what I highly recommend. I'm not sure they're going to follow it or not, but this is what I highly recommend you do. You know, yeah, get, get in my book. You know, I'm going to send you the 10 reasons video. It's seven minutes long. Um, it's super practical. I don't, I don't include religious reasons because I don't think people relate to that. I, and, and I cost a little bit and I think that's probably why it went viral. Cause I just keep, it's so practical. Um, but I have a book, Why Waiting Works. You can get a free copy at whywaitingworks.net. Uh, you get a bunch of other bonuses with it. Um, I do actually have a, a coaching program called Unleash the Best You. And that's at Unleash the Best. And it's basically just, it's a six week program. Um, so when I, when I became abstinent, so the second time, so the first time I became abstinent was six years straight. Then second time was nine years ago. I, I backslid there and just, I, you know, got resentful that God hadn't sent me a wife yet. So I, I made some mistakes, but I started meeting with high performance coaches nine years ago really just to figure out what the hell I'm here for. I think that was the thing that was missing for me was having a clear destination of the life that I was trying to build for myself and my purpose on, to be on this earth. And I just put all those, those techniques into one six week program. It's called Unleash the Best You. So again, unleashthebest.com. But if anybody wants to connect with me personally, it's Rob B. Kowalski is my username on Facebook, Instagram. I'm also on YouTube. And City Fam is my heart. That is the, the organization I started. And it's really about helping people uh, find a tribe of like-minded people to do life with as they become the best version of themselves. When I, when I started waiting, life got really lonely and boring, you know, like I, cause my life was going to the clubs and chasing girls. And then all of a sudden I realized, okay, this, you know, for me, it started out as with Christianity. Like, okay, I signed, I signed up to be a Christian. I know I can't behave like this anymore, but I don't really know what else to do with myself. You know, like I, all my friends were partiers the Christian, the, the people in the church were a little bit weird to me. I was like, well, who the hell do I hang out with now? So I just stayed in a lot and I was assuming I'd meet a girl and get married and that didn't happen. So I just isolated a lot and that's not a long-term solution for anyone to really thrive in. So city fam is attempting to solve that problem. Like, Hey, look, you want to make right decisions. Awesome. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't, we shouldn't enjoy life also in the process. So we do a lot of social events. We do a lot of service events and that's at cityfam.com. We actually have chapters sprouting up all over the place and uh, would love to connect with anybody that wants to know more about it. Well, I appreciate you, Rob. Thank you so much for being on, on the show. Looking forward to getting to know you more and what you do for everyone out there, you know, teaching delay gratification. You know, you know, you certainly have come so far in life. You have so many experiences and now you, you bottled it up. 
to what you've learned and you're teaching other people what actually works. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Sam. Hey guys, if you liked today's episode, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, leave me a review, and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we shared today. Really appreciate it. God bless.